Welcome to the Property Buyer Podcast, where we explore the world of residential and commercial real estate to help you make better decisions about buying, selling, or investing in all types of property. Join me, Rich Harvey, CEO of propertybuyer.com.au and multi-award winning buyer's advocate. Our podcast features expert interviews, market trends and insights, and practical tips for navigating the complex world of Australian real estate. Whether you're a home buyer, a seasoned property investor, commercial buyer, developer, or simply curious about the property market, our podcast is for you. Join us as we share our knowledge, strategies, and experience, and help you achieve your property goals. Welcome to another edition of the Property Vibe Podcast. And in this episode, we'll be looking at how you can use data and artificial intelligence, AI, to make better property decisions. Today, we're surrounded by a plethora of data providers, yet how do we decide which sources of data are accurate? And how should we interpret the data that we're seeing? It's really important to get real-time data versus just looking at historical data so you can make present-day decisions about property investment or even buying a home. To help us unpack everything in this mysterious data world, we have no one better than Luke Metcalf, data scientist and founder of Microburbs. Welcome, Luke. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, Rich. Pleasure. So, Luke, we have a tradition on our podcast, and I've thrown this one. It's a bit of a curveball to you. You didn't know this was coming. It's a statistical one. It's a thought by um, Charles Swindle, who says, life is 10% what happens to me, 90% how I react to it. What do you take from that thought? Yeah. Yeah. So, obviously, uh, a lot of people sit on the fence when it comes to buying a property, And uh, there's a whole lot of people that have the FOMO and they are sitting on the sidelines and they they regret not buying when their friend did. So obviously uh, you need to take responsibility for yourself in your property purchasing decisions. Mm. And uh, don't be someone who could see that there was a great opportunity and miss it. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. I think a lot of people blame the market. They blame their circumstances for not being able to buy. But at the end of the day, you know, we're all born with nothing, we leave with nothing, so it's, it is how you react to it. So Luke, I've got a couple of questions. Um, what sort of created your fascination with property and data and, and what sparked your interest in the property market? Yeah, I'm gonna wind the clock back to the age of five. Yeah. It's a bit weird. So my dad bought me a computer and I got obsessed with programming. Excellent. Uh, there were simple little chatbots, but the thing that really excited me was that uh, I could get more out of it than what I put in. So the simple code that I wrote, more came back. So people believe these little chatbots were alive, even though they obviously weren't. And then uh, fast forward to the 1990s. So I'm making little applications and things, but I really got into data analysis because out of that, I could learn things that no one else knew. So there were amazing insights. So my first job during the dot-com boom, I was able to mine the data and know things that the marketing lady didn't know. Uh, and then uh, fast forward again to today, uh, obviously this is a really important uh, question. So it's the, most, it's the biggest decision people make in their lives, mm. um, where they live. So it's a very rich problem. Uh, so I love that I can bring in, what I really love to do, what I'm passionate about is bringing in data from many sources. Mm. So trying to get a full picture. So if you're trying to model human decision making, there's actually a lot that goes into it. You can't have simple rules you can't do it on a. You can't do it all on a spreadsheet. Uh, so taking into a, a account, you know, lifestyle and amenity and uh, market information, uh, demographics, finances, all these things coming together. For me, that that comes back to that magic yeah. that I felt when I was five, which is like, wow, this code feels like it's alive. And then extra dimension is like not only what property is suitable for the person, but then. The hardest thing of all, which is what does the future hold? So if data, it doesn't, data doesn't know all the answers by any means, but uh, to be able to reliably run an algorithm that can predict the future is a, a pretty magical thing. Awesome. I love it. There's like a synergy that comes from the mm. data analysis. It's like you extract more information to help you move forward. I love that. So, I mean, I trained as an economist, as you know, in my background. Mm. And, I was fascinated by how the economy works, how the world works, and that's why I did it. And there's always a joke about economists and they go, they know how everything works. They just assume it. They just make assumptions you know, to work yeah. out their models, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely pay attention to economic models. I'm not mm. an economist, mm. 
but it's one of those things that comes up. So obviously supply and demand mm. are the simplest level. Mm. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think that kind of curiosity that you get from an economics degree mm. that mm. opens you up to all different ways of thinking, I think that w puts you in great it's, stead as you, a buyer's agent. You just made a really good point, way of thinking. I mean, I did econometrics and economics. I did a master's mm. as well, but econometrics I found fascinating because it is, it's these models, it's these constructs of how human behave, how consumers think and behave. And it's not perfect, but it is a model and it mm. does show you generally what might happen. And no one's gonna, no model is perfect, but yep. I do think it, it does create a general direction, a general synergy of what's gonna happen. Yeah, so. um, your audience may not know, but econometrics is like the smart man's economics. Exactly. And yeah. uh, it's actually concerned with causation, mm. which is very hard. So mm. very often, I don't know. I just know that one thing is a leading indicator of, an, of another, and maybe that's yeah. enough. Mm. Uh, but to actually concern yourself with what causes what, uh, people may not appreciate that that's a harder problem than it might seem when you're talking to your mates at the barbecue. So tell me about microbirds. You set up microbirds. Why did you set it up and, and what's it all about? What kind of benefits does it provide to, to the average person? Yeah, so on the one hand, you've got these subjective sort of suburb views, suburb reviews, yeah? So the picture that's painted by the real estate agent or by people who live in the area, um, you know, you've got your brand suburbs like Glebe and Newtown and St Kilda and Bondi and uh, Fortitude Valley and Cottesloe. Um, they, so that one thing was that you had these big brand suburbs. I felt like most of the country is being neglected. Yeah, you don't have the same stories being yeah. told about them. Uh, but and then you had like raw sort of data providers. Yeah, typically talking at a very aggregate level. So they're talking about like what's the uh, outlook for uh, prices in Perth or something like that, yeah? So what re has really struck me is I can get lots of data down to a really fine-grained level, so I can actually start to talk about really localized things. What's life like on your street? Will your street go up in value? Mm. What kinds of properties uh, will go up in value? So for me, it's like a merging of people's ordinary daily lives and, and science mm. at, at this lower level so mm. it's really exciting to be on the microburbs so you're saying it's a blend of art and science because mm. when you mention those suburbs you know i think you know cottesloe lifestyle suburb glebe mm. and, and newtown great you know they're grungy trendy inner city sydney suburbs they're mm. great and people think they know you know everything about king street for example but mm. you can identify a much more granular kind of data right Is that that's right yeah mm. so we look at individual property purchases and sales mm. uh so that means that we can control for things like did they do a renovation? So if you're going to go in as an investor and buy a property, uh, you don't want to ha have to factor in the cost having to do a renovation like the neighbors are. Um, and when you've got all of these pairs of properties being sold, bought and sold, you have millions and millions of data points to learn from. So you can find way more. So mm -hmm. a, a, a theme you'll find, I hope I can get this across, is that having lots of data allows you to do better science. Yeah. Yeah? When you've only got a few data points, yeah. that's like, that's in the realm of um, analogy and, yep. you know, it may have, it may be true, but it's like, it's not, it doesn't have that uh, provability that you can when you've got a very large amount of data. Mm. So for us, having every property since 1990 for the whole country, pretty much, uh, to the degree that it was digitized, uh, means that uh, we can talk about a lot more stuff. Whereas if you're just looking at median prices on um, suburbs, suburbs are very diverse places, mm. uh, you're having to like do, draw a lot of inference yourself and bring in a whole lot of your own uh, theories into things. Mm. So we have a more of a like, let's just prove it scientifically. And, it. and if we can't, we'll certainly provide the data to people so they can mm. draw, draw their own uh, conclusions. You're touching on a really good theme and that is that people, a lot of property investors or property experts uh, think they know about the market. They mm. have a hunch, right? They've yep. got a theory as you say, but there's no way for them to validate that. What you're saying is microburbs can actually, with that many data points you've got, mm. you, know, you can actually validate and create a construct of an area and really drill into a suburb to, to pinpoint each individual property and its characteristics. That's right. Yeah. So a local property expert, a buyer's agent or a seller's agent, they will have certain advantages in that they will ha know the talk on the street. They'll know what certain properties are going to go for or just went for, um, what kinds of buyers were in there. There's a certain flavor that they have, but a disadvantage is that they only know um, a small market, uh, whereas our AI can, has seen the entire property market since mm. 1990. Mm. So it's like 
to what degree is um, this place special? And it, it, one way of thinking of it is like lookalikes, yeah? yeah? So there might be other suburbs on the other side of the country that have been through this before and are fitting into certain patterns. Mm. And so you can think of it as like this all seeing, mm. uh, not necessarily all knowing, but certainly <laughs> seeing a lot of stuff yep. uh, across the country. Are you saying that your, your product is omnipotent? You know? <laughs> uh, no, there's lots of things that we don't know. So for example, if you wanted to know whether something is going to be subdivided, yeah. then uh, you might want to like network with the local council or yeah. uh, developers or something. Love it, love it, that's great. Um, I guess just a, a negative thing that I often hear around the traps is some people are quite cynical about data analysts. They say mm. they can't see the wood for the trees or that you know, too much data actually creates this thing called paralysis of analysis. Yeah. Um, what do you say to those people that say that there's just too much data is, is bad? I think it's very true if you are a human trying to digest it all. So there are, there's a, a limit to how much um, we all can digest. That includes me. Yep. So uh, you, can, you can end up with people that are looking at data, trying to confirm theories that they've already found. So they've looked at five data points, they've seen a pattern, and now anything new that comes along, either they will um, make it conform to that or they'll have some excuse mm. of why it doesn't. <laughs> so sometimes it feels like it's, you're down at the TAB and people have a, a you know, they, they, they just know, they have a sense. Yeah. And it's like, so yeah, you can definitely go down rabbit holes with data. What do you call that bias? What is the bit name you give that when someone has a preconceived idea of what the outcome is going Confirmation to be? bias. Confirmation bias. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's an absolute killer. Mm. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, so yeah, my approach is try and go always from first principles. So mm. always go back to asking the biggest question. So it's not like, I come up with a theory and then I come up with 10 ways um, where I can prove the theory. Obviously, you've got to illustrate, yeah. but it's more like, okay, um, we are trying to predict the biggest one is capital growth. Yeah. So go back to first principles, yeah. ask the question, what drives capital growth and make sure this data is included in it, uh, but keep in all the other data because that other data might actually be better at telling, at finding the pattern or it may qualify it. So it may say, okay, this applies only for supply constricted mm. uh, metro markets mm. and not regional markets or something like that. Mm. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, you actually just touched on a really good point, capital growth. And in your experience, you're looking at data and millions of data points every day. What, what do you suggest are the key primary drivers of capital growth? Yeah, so I guess the first thing is that as an asset class, real estate has performed well. So the overall, so since 1990, Properties have gone up a lot, so that's that's a base. But obviously, you want to do better than that, though. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a big, uh, huge thing for us is uh, that comes up over and over again. This is very reliable. So, uh, our models are all about what can we, what makes money in every single uh, market in every year. Mostly, every year, the 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 suburbs that it picks. Uh, on average, they go up, they beat the market by a lot. So that includes during the GFC, mm. during COVID, uh, during the mining boom. So it's like an overall, uh, what drives capital growth? And it's not like I come in and edit the model because I think that I have a personal opinion on work from home or something like that. Mm. So uh, th this kind of model, uh, two big things that it finds. One is uh, what's called mean reversion. So that is when a suburb has gone up, a lot, uh, it's going to fall back again relative to the national average. Mm. And I should mention, we're always trying to predict relative to the national average. So I'm not a macro guy. Um, I just want to know how it's going to perform compared to everything else. I don't know what's going to happen in China yep. with the shadow banking yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you have um, suburbs overshoot and undershoot. Uh, there's a good time to buy in them. So over, you can see this over like a five to 10 year period. Uh, and over shorter periods as well. So it depends on the situation. But yeah, you'll have lots of cases where a suburb has gone up like 2.5x in five years, and then it does nothing for the next five years. Mm. So uh, mean reversion is a really big one. Um, and uh, another one is uh, just a mispricing relative to other suburbs. Uh, so I'm partnered with uh, Jeremy Shepard of DSR Data on this, yep. and uh, he refers to, he talks about what's called the ripple effect, yep. which is, I believe, not his, but uh, he's very famous for it. Mm. Uh, so what you can have is that a suburb gets really hot. Uh, you don't need that many buyers in a suburb to make it go up. 
So you only need a couple of buyers bidding on the one property to push prices up. Whereas if you've got zero or one buyer, then it's a seller's market. So you have, an un, you have a small number of buyers mo moving around chasing prices and uh, they don't um, organize with one another to spread themselves evenly across the country. And so uh, you will often have that uh, there is a suburb that has just been uh, underpriced. So even though you might have a suburb that has more amenity, is more cool, and it goes up first, then you might have a forgotten suburb that's less of a brand name. Maybe not as many people search for it in realestate.com.au, uh, but over time they'll come to it. Another aspect is that uh, if there isn't transparency on pricing, then people might spend time in a market attending auctions um, if they don't have a good buyer's agent like yourself that can't that doesn't like isn't managing expectations uh, then uh, they could be like uh, I, we attend a whole lot and think oh geez this is actually out of our budget we've mm. got to go further out mm. Mm. Uh, or I haven't been able to talk down places like I thought or the properties didn't end uh, we spent three weekends looking at properties and the cheap ones actually had these all these big shortcomings so our dreams of before have gone uh, so you've got uh, yeah, a, a, a big difference in um, markets based on, so you can track them. So there are markets mm -hmm. that are, if you think of it as like share trading, mm -hmm. so there are markets that are highly correlated. And when one, so this is called pair trading. So you, when one market uh, diverges from another, then you, the, the models will often expect a, a correction. Mm -hmm. And there are markets that are inversely correlated mm -hmm. as well, which yeah, is interesting. Okay. Yeah. What about um, some people say, oh, population growth is, is a critical factor for, mm. for suburb growth. Now, I disagree with that. I think it is a factor. Mm. You definitely need to have, I mean, it increases demand, but it all comes relative to supply. Yeah. I mean, for example, Southwest Sydney, there's huge tracts of land around Leppington, Austral, for example, that are all being developed now. Mm. Um, now, the zonings that will allow for that. But you pick an area like Mossman or Bondi, for example, mm. there's not a lot of greenfield land to do lots of subdivisions, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not just one factor in isolation. That's right. And I think uh, the other factors we often quote in our business is, is employment growth and infrastructure. So new infrastructure, like a, a new train line, a major hospital, mm. uh, new schools, um, you know, any kind of new education facilities, they are all big drive, particularly hospital precincts. I think medical precincts attract a lot of um, really highly qualified staff and mm. medical professionals, which increases, I think, demand in that area. Um, doesn't mean all the doctors want to live in Westmead, for example. Um, but what do you think about those sort of factors as, as drivers of capital Yeah, growth? so I guess the biggest rookie mistake is to look at previous population growth. Because if the population's already moved in, they got housed. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> They're already there. So yeah. are you then making a call that you're expecting there to be a momentum that is more population because other population has come in. So yeah. that may not be the case. Mm. And then yes, broadly, I think what you're saying is it, it always matters supply and demand. Mm. So infrastructure can increase demand. Mm. So it can be all very well to have a new train line put in and that may, there's probably some figure to uh, put to how many more people would want to live there as a result of that. How, how easily could you sell units mm. at a profit uh, how many more units could you sell at a profit given a metro line in there? Mm. But you always have to ask, well, how many units are there going to be? You mm. could still overshoot. Mm. Yeah. And, put, and uh, infrastructure is, tends to be tied to supply. So uh, I understand there's a proposal out by uh, the young liberals uh, here in New South Wales, uh, and they want to uh, make it that near every train station, there's unlimited density. Yeah. <laughs> So, and it makes sense, yeah. so there's definitely logic to it, but yeah. it's like, you have to take that into account. Mm. Uh, the, 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 these things are complicated and infrastructure also is complicated because uh, when do you take uh, the, when does the price go up, yeah? So is it on the rumor? Is it on the plan? Is it when it starts to be uh, built? Like, so you need to have some expertise to know like, when has the price been realized so if people, maybe people have already bought in or fully expecting that it's been fully priced in this new infrastructure and it's just silly people who buy from then on in. Just on that point alone, that's a really good point you raise because infrastructure is a big driver in my view of capital growth, but it doesn't, infrastructure doesn't always get built. So I reckon there's mm. definitely a mini spike 
when it's announced, there's definitely people buy in on the anticipation. It's like mm. sort of almost a trading bet. I believe that this train line or this tunnel or whatever is going to happen. Like say the Northern Beaches yeah. Tunnel, for example. It was announced to the previous Liberal governments, yeah, it's going to go ahead. They did the drilling and then the Labor government got in and said, no, nah, we're ditching that for indefinitely. Yeah. Um, but the biggest spike happens, um, I reckon, just before it's completed. People realise that there's going to be travel savings times. I mean, Borkham Hills, for example, you remember the M2 was built back in, I can't remember what year it was, mm. but I remember median prices jumped about 30% the year after it opened because suddenly it knocked 15 minute, minutes travel time off into the city. It was amazing. Mm. Suddenly made it a much more accessible area. So I think you're right, but you've got to make sure the infrastructure is actually going to get built. And at the moment, I think yeah. uh, the government's paring back quite a bit of infrastructure because they just can't afford it and they want to keep their service. Yeah, there are two levels of benefiting from infrastructure. So one is just being in a house that now is quicker to get into town. Mm. Another one is if it's your land that the infrastructure is going to get built on. Yeah. Mm. So what does that look like? Does that mean, or it's really close to the infrastructure. So uh, if you can anticipate a change in zoning, so if you have a home where a, a station is going to be built and su suddenly you can fit way more people for the land, then you're going to get a, that, that's a more surefire bet mm. of uh, yeah. growth. And you might have people come out of the woodwork who listen to a spruker that are knocking on your door trying to buy an option for your property. Mm. That's a pretty good sign that mm. yeah. uh, things are going to go up. Sure. Just back to capital growth, just, um, I guess amenity and lifestyle seem to be, in my mind, key drivers. Do you, is that something you can measure and do you believe that's a key component of capital growth? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a work in progress. There's, it definitely determines the value. Mm. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, you can just look at prices and see that uh, they're higher where there is amenity and where there's not. Uh, there's definitely things going on there. So uh, there's things like um, demographics um, and, and the kinds of, I've been finding the kinds of businesses that crop up and also what's in their balance sheets actually are predictors of capital growth. Mm. So yes, um, I think it is a, a good thing to understand. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a bit of watch this space in terms of uh, mm. Mm. how it influences how it capital growth. It's not yeah. as straightforward as you might think. No, exactly. Yeah. I mean, even in the paper today, there was an article about uh, a property in the eastern suburbs that sold for $9 million more than the one next door because the one next door had a view of the opera house. Mm. And it's saying, what price is a view? You know, and the opera house is obviously iconic. Mm. And, you know, it's there's no exact science, but it definitely people are willing to pay more, the WTP analogy, or yeah. oh, sorry, phenomenon, for really high amenity. So I think that's definitely a factor, but it's not the only factor. Yeah, yeah. So, in that, I mean, one, it's uh, always supply and demand, really, isn't it? Exactly. So there's a limited number of properties yeah. that can see yeah. the opera house. Yeah. So uh, if there was a way, if we built a big dome around the opera house and everyone could see it, then it'd be a different story. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, those sort of iconic views are limited and so you can expect that. And if you can identify things that will be in short supply, continue to be in short supply in the future, then uh, expect some capital growth. That's a great point. We'll come back to that. Tell me about the mistakes that people make or, or guess what, I mean, the least important factors for capital growth. So what are mm. the least important factors? In other words, what do some investors just get too hung up on mm. that they shouldn't bother about? I think there's a kind of lazy approach as an investor where you just, you think of it as just a couple of black and white choices. Yeah. So you just go, okay, regional versus um, metro. And then, okay, it's Brisbane versus Sydney. And then you go, okay, and now I have this much to afford. So I'm going to go to the Western suburbs to buy. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, the big thing doing all this data analysis is you learn that there are many ways to make money in real estate. There are many different approaches. And uh, I think if you just go too high level, then you're taking, if, you're not, if it's not backed by local knowledge or, and, or, and or fine grained data, preferably the both working together, um, then uh, you're not going to make money. You're, so you don't think of it as like, I can understand from the point of view of an investor just talking at dinner parties and barbecues is like, should I invest in the country or the city? Should I go out of Sydney versus inner city? Um, there are, so overall, Metro has outperformed regional, but there have been uh, amazing regional um, growths, like bl absolute blow away um, regional growth. So it's a bit like, uh, the city is a bit like eBay, so it's more commodified. Mm. So that one suburb is more correlated to the next mm. and regional Australia is more like a garage sale. 
So you just don't know what bargains you're going to pick up. And it may be mm. that something is really mispriced. Mm. So on, on the one hand, someone might say, oh, this is a lovely town. We don't want to sell to any outsiders. Um, I'm very attached to this thing. Uh, mm. And so it's overpriced. But mm. then on the other hand, it may simply be, oh, it's, it's junk. Mm. And they don't know what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like uh, there are all kinds of ways. So I, I just, mm. yeah, when people ask me, should it be one or the other, this kind of black and white thinking, <laughs> And I'm like, well, I just, I go bottom up. So yeah. if I can look at every property I can or mm. every suburb mm. and there's a whole lot of factors going on. And uh, so, yeah, I guess it's more of an overall philosophy of uh, um, thinking and then the kinds of uh, data points you look for that arise mm. from that. I think you're right. I think some investors shouldn't have such a black and white view of it's got to be option A or B. You know, I think there's a role for regional and there's a role for mm. metro and you can make money in both. Uh, it is also a question of how much money you want to make and what's the long-term exit strategy. Mm, so I'm yeah. always advising my clients, if you're buying into a market now, particularly if say a regional area, it might be fantastically hot now for a certain reason. Yeah. But in 10 years' time, when COVID's a distant memory or the gold mine's closed down or that agriculture has been replaced by something else, yeah. will that town still have the same kind of supply-demand equation in the future yeah. versus something that's been tried and tested for 100 years? Yeah, the more remote it is, the more volatile the market is. Yeah, so it's kind so, of like those penny stocks, you know. They yeah, can exactly. fly, fly up in a, in a minute, yeah. but they could also come back. That's you know? right. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about medium prices, Luke. Um, and again, this is one of my hobby horses. I know it's one of yours. Do you think that median price is an accurate measure of the real market price of a property in a suburb? Tell me why, why not you think that? Yeah, so the uh, median is just the middle point out of all the sales. So a simple way of calculating it is what have been the sales over a given period and what's the middle property? But at opposite ends of the spectrum, you're going to get different kinds of properties. So you'll have the really low end ones, the really high end ones, and you think, okay, yep, middle, that sounds fine. But the problem is that uh, markets aren't perfect little distributions from high to low. So a classic example might be if you have a suburb that's got, let's say you've got all of these 1970s walk-up um, homes and they cost 500 grand each. And then they come in and build some beautiful new, beautiful sum, uh, Meriton homes, and they cost a million dollars each, yeah? Now let's imagine there's 40% Meriton homes and 60% walk-ups. Uh, that it's, doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be the exact same number of new homes versus old homes selling at any point. Mm. And what you can see on a raw graph is that it just keeps on jumping up and down between two types. You see it all the time in the raw data. Mm. And it's like, no, you have to understand that uh, there is a broader context to the market. Mm. Too few properties are sold at mm. any given point in time. Uh, another problem with median prices is that different kinds of properties sell in different markets. So the low end of the market, the bottom um, 20%, sells pretty reliably in any market. But as you go for the, the higher end, it's harder to move high-end merchandise. Mm. So this is similar to a concept in other markets of a floor price, yeah? So mm. if you're selling a house at the floor price, there's always going to be someone who will take it, yeah? So they'll come from... Um, a maybe they'll come from a cheaper suburb but they're like oh wow i can be a bit closer to town mm. and i can get that or maybe it's someone who would have normally bought a, a mid-level property but because of economic conditions mm. uh, they just want a base level uh, it may be in the um, tougher economic times people are prepared to buy um, a lower quality building and then um, add to it later whereas in, if they're if they're feeling more optimistic they might buy a, a beautiful new home like this one. Mm. So uh, that's another problem. Um, and then another, so these problems lead the existing players to just drag it out over a longer period so they can make these nice smooth mm. curves. <laughs> uh, but for us at Microburbs, our only customer is the buyer and the buyer's agent. Mm. So we don't have other mm. kinds of people to deal with. So we don't, we're much more into just like, let's price uh, find the price that's most reflective of uh, current conditions. So what's your method? How do you measure? What's the best method of measuring price in a suburb? Yeah, so one is to do this hedonic adjustment, which we do. So that is like accounting for the kinds of properties that are sold now. Uh, but the other is to use machine learning. So to look at what's, what's going on in the rest of the market to ask what would the median price be if there was enough volume? So the existing players, they just go, oh, not enough volume. 
I'm either not going to give you an answer at all, so we don't tell you about two-unit, two-bedroom homes in Forestville, uh, or they just make the, the curve really smooth. So they're including prices from 12 months ago. Mm. So we don't do that. We're about, okay, we'll find the best price. What, what is the most reflective price right now, uh, even if it, the curve looks a bit funny, even if it looks like it jumps up and down? Mm. So my research has found that even after two weeks, so looking at properties, pairs of properties that are bought and sold in the same time periods, um, really close to one another, the relation markets break down within about two, they start to decorrelate um, after two weeks. Mm. So we're doing a monthly, which is still pretty good. Mm. Um, and then the other part of it is coming back to that representation of the housing stock. It's really important to break it down. Yeah. So if you want to have the high quartile and bottom quartile, so the top, you know, the, the top quartile might be the homes that have been built in the past 10 years. Yeah. Obviously, they're going to be a, it'll be a different kind of market to someone at the uh, bottom quartile. Mm -hmm. So we provide it. Um, we provide those, and also we provide um, by number of bedrooms, which is a, a similar Perfect. achieving a similar aim. That's so important. I mean, I, I get so frustrated with median prices. I find them incredibly misleading because you talk about the diversity of property stock. Mm. You know, two bedroom units to even three bedroom units plus studies versus a two bedroom house to a five bedroom house. Yeah. And, you know, in a suburb, the median might be 2.1, but it's very difficult to buy a decent house for 2.1. You need to be spending 2.8, 2.7, whatever, to actually buy something decent. Yeah. So unfortunately, a lot of people that are a bit green or haven't been looking think, oh, you're a buyer's agent, you're a miracle worker, you can buy me a six-bedroom house for 2.1. Yeah. Sorry, we can't. We're, as if, we're about 10 years too late, you know? <laughs> as if it's like a recommended retail price. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, as yeah. if the government says, <laughs> yeah. you shouldn't pay more than this. That's right. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. So doing a stratified median, and actually looking at the individual property types and mm. what kind of median price applies to that property type. And then I know within your program too, you've also got the ability to look at different areas within a suburb yeah. and a breakdown of medians mm. within an area of a suburb because we know that there's so-called golden triangles within a suburb or, mm. or streets closer to the shops or to a, to a, tra a bus uh, or a train connection there or a quieter part of the suburb right away from the main road. They're better, you know, so... People are almost always surprised when they see, so you, as you guys are delivering with these reports, mm. um, when you show this to the... Uh, uh, buyers agents already know this stuff, but when you show it to a punter, they're like, mm. they're amazed. Oh, yeah. wow, yeah, it really is different. Yeah, yeah. There's a massive difference in price. And this comes down to that local knowledge, you mm. know, combining both art and science. You know what I'm saying? It's the art. I mean, our buyers agents are all local specialists. They know the market, they know the agents, they know the streets, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but to be able to back it up with that kind of data, I think that's a very, very powerful um, story. Yeah, yeah. So you can, people can understand that the life on the main road in a unit is very different to the life down the road by the bush. Very different kind of person lives there. Exactly. Um, you know, you, the people by the bush, it's going to be more of an independent home. That whereas the the people by um, the unit in ta um, on the main road, they're going to be much more dependent on um, amenity. Mm. Let's talk about property supply. We've talked a bit about demand drivers. Let's talk about supply. What are some good ways that you reckon uh, we can measure supply property in a in a suburb or a region? Yeah, yeah. So there's many different levels so i break up supply based on how far into the future so uh one thing there's current supply so the number of listings um, available so you can look at the number of months of inventory to uh, sell uh, the property um, so if it, if there's a whole given how long it takes uh, in a usual month to uh, sell all the merchandise if you have a lot of um, inventory on the market and will take a long time, mm. uh, then that's a bad sign for the short term uh, price of the market. Uh, and yeah, there are things like also we found house to unit ratios. So when uh, houses get too expensive, people move to units and uh, there's a whole, there's many things other, else going on, but there is some bleed from one to the other. Um, so that, that's uh, one thing. Then you've got coming supply. So things like uh, what's on the horizon, so DAs and the primary market. So if uh, it's new builds uh, or people are um, building villas and things, then you've got potential supply. So that's like, what does the government let you do given the land that's there? So what could people put in if they wanted to? So that comes down to zoning things like floor space ratio, how big can they build, uh, sub minimum lot size to subdivide, uh, height of buildings. So 
uh, that is something, if people can actually, of their own volition, add to the supply, that's something to know about. Uh, it may be okay if you're going to be the person who does that, um, but yeah. Uh, then there's uh, future supply, so things like land release and growth zones, so the, the bigger plans that the government has. Uh, and then there's like uh, other strategic things like we talked about before with infrastructure. So uh, um, you mentioned, uh, was it Borkham Hills, mm. where uh, new infrastructure is coming in and you just know that governments like to put new homes where the infrastructure is going to be. Mm. Excellent. There's a lot of good suggestions there. I think, you know, Core Logic they put out sort of two measures. There's new listings and total listings. And total listings, which combines new and old listings together, is mm. about on Australia wide, it's down about nineteen to twenty percent, the five year average. So mm. but that's just an average, you know, across the but it shows that listings are, are tight. People seem to be holding on to their properties yeah. longer. An associated metric of days on market. Yes. So yeah. how quickly is yeah. how quickly is the merchandise being moved? Obviously, if it's sticking around for a long time, uh, then even though the vendors probably want to sell, then uh, that's a sign that it's a slow market, buyers mm. have lots of choice mm. and they have the ability to talk down price. So let's talk about how can investors um, use that sort of data point to avoid buying in areas that could become oversupplied or are oversupplied in the future. Mm. Uh, yeah, so months of inventory. Uh, I, I guess this is my bias here, but uh, I throw it all into an algorithm. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's like, uh, yeah, I, I don't do it manually myself. So th there's a lot of different factors mm. that go into it. Um, and yeah, so I'll focus on uh, what I can scientifically prove. Great, perfect, yeah. yeah, okay. I mean, anecdotally, I mean, I look at certain areas like the Ripley Valley, which is west of Ipswich. Um, a lot of land out there, uh, a lot of the infrastructure is not in place yet, but it could be. Mm. Um, so that's an area that potentially could be oversupplied in the future. Mm. Um, again, the southwest of Sydney, I won't say it's oversupplied, but there is a lot of land to be released. So what I'm saying is that it's an area that I think will have very low to moderate price growth, mm. not high price growth. Mm. And as an investor, I want high price growth. I want yeah. to buy in suburbs that's very tightly held, where there's low days on market, where there's very limited inventory stock, where it yeah. does sell quickly, um, where there's a high proportion of, of owner occupier to to, uh, inv to, yeah, absolutely. to investors and units. They're the kind of tightly held, and where the controls by the council are very tight. They're the kind of areas for me that I recommend our investors buy yeah. because you're not suddenly going to see, you know, blocks and blocks of Meriton apartments with 300 per tower being built there. Yeah. So for this reason, units are more dangerous. Mm. Uh, so I was looking yesterday at what have been the times where the where investors have made the most money collectively and where they've made the least. And there are lots of times where it's just a whole lot of units come onto the market all the same time and they make eye-watering losses. They all sell at the same time. Ouch. And uh, so, yeah, with units, obviously, the ability to just add more yeah. subject to government mm. so that you can meet the demand mm. more easily with units. Mm. Uh, so and obviously, also, you're getting less land and land is the thing that's truly valuable. That makes houses in general a better bet. Cool. Um, this is more a general question, but I'd like to, to discuss the interpretation of your property data that you've got. How should savvy investors and home buyers use the data that you can provide to their advantage to make a better property decision? Yeah, so you want to take emotion out of it too much. You don't want to be just uh, taken by a few things that resonate with you because try and imagine that you're, you're told a couple of things at a barbecue by your mate who did well last year in the property market and someone else has been told um, the same thing by another mate who has the exact opposite um, uh, thing. You know, go, go for the coast, go for inland. Uh, so... Uh, just un understand that you have a, a, a more limited uh, view. Mm. Another thing would be uh, don't follow all the trends. So if, if everyone is touting Gladstone as the place to get in, <laughs> then that's probably a bad sign. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, uh, it probably is going to go up too much. There's too much in there. There may be limited supply. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, you want to, for, for me, I, I try and find the most universal universally proven data. So uh, we do back testing over back to 1990. Uh, it's over the whole country. It's as fine grained as we possibly can. So there's a distinction between the data point, which is persuasive, and then a more scientific view where it's like, hey, we can prove this stuff works. So 
uh, the more you can do the science, the less you're sort of going by instincts. I mean, you may well have good instincts. It could be, you could, you could be right mm. on the money with something, mm. but you probably don't have the same level of instinct as a property professional who's been in the uh, mm. game for a long time yeah. uh, or someone who's been analyzing the data mm. for a very long time or better still both working together. Perfect. Yeah, cool. Um, now, Luke, COVID brought quite a few changes to our property market, and we had lots of you know dire predictions about everything. But it did bring a few significant changes in mm. the property market. What permanent changes do you think COVID might have brought about into the property market? Yeah, so I definitely we saw the regions go up a lot with uh, COVID. I'll be interested to hear your view as well. Mm. Um, and I understand that searches for things like home offices and pools and yards. So outdoor space uh, became more popular. And I think COVID is one of these things that where it was exacerbating existing trends. So obviously it, became, it was already technologically much more easy to work from home. Uh, the home can be more of an independent thing as you've got home delivery and home theaters instead of going to the movies. So yeah, I'd be interested to hear what you, what you found. Yeah, interesting you meant about the people fleeing to the regions. There was a survey done this year of about 5,000 people that actually moved out of all the capital cities to the regions. And they asked them, after two years, how's life? Are you thinking about moving back? Mm. About 50% said they actually made a bad choice and wow. they want to move back. And about wow. 35% had already moved back wow. for whatever reason. And I think it's because of social dislocation. In mm. other words, if you're moving away from an established social network of family, friends, connections, and your sports mm. club and all that, you got to miss it. And I think people really didn't value, understand just how much they valued that community. Yeah. So you're probably going to see about at least half of those that moved out come back. So the tide's gone out, the tide's come back in. Not all of it's come back in. Mm. I think some people I know myself who've personally moved to Newcastle or Gold Coast or Sunny Coast, and they love it, you know, and that's great. Um, but there was a bit of regional regret. I think the other major chain that's permanent is a hybrid working from home. I don't think it's ever going to go back to five days a week at the office. Mm. I'm seeing it to being um, between three to four days in the office and usually one day a week from home. That's the kind of thing I'm seeing because it gives people more work-life balance. You know, we've all got to pay bills and get washing done and you can do it in between a few phone calls, whatever. Yeah. You still, your employer still expects you to get the work done. And I know a lot of my team can be just as effective at home uh, as at the office, but you do miss the collaboration and you do need that collaboration mm. in an office environment. So I think... There's some interesting changes that I think are going to be permanent there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So on that uh, life quality friendship thing, so it's harder to meet people these days. You mm. can't, people don't talk to one another in the street as much. Mm. Uh, there's way fewer volunteer organizations. So things like Rotary mm. um, have passed from previous generations. Mm. Uh, sport is about all that's left in terms of volunteer organizations. We used mm. to be a great nation of um, belonging to all kinds of those sort of things, the women's auxiliary and the church and all of that. And uh, there's some amazing stats out of America uh, about how people are losing. They, they have fewer friends and the proportion mm. of men who now say they have no friends and it's mm. happening for women as well. Mm. Uh, just yesterday, I, you have to verify this one, but uh, um, I saw that uh, apparently there was a study that found that people used to spend 60 minutes um, a day with friends and now uh, and then 20 years later it's um, down to 20 minutes Wow! so I think people probably be, we're in a world of distraction by screens mm. and I think we probably do uh, undervalue our friends Absolutely. and underestimate how hard it is to make new genuine mm. friendships particularly mm. as you get older mm. so you've got to be um, intentional about it mm. that's, that's the key message there yeah so Luke, um, when you're looking to invest in property, what are the first steps that you'd recommend an investor take when researching where to buy? Mm. Yeah, so obviously, very first thing would be to uh, know your budget. So that'd be the very first. So uh, Go to a broker, work out your budget. Yep, yep that's it. And uh, stick within that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously know how much cash flow there's going to be. Um, and uh, yeah, I, obviously, this is an area you would deal with all the time. I'm interested in your view on this one. <laughs> yeah, well, some of the thing, it's uh, first thing we do is, is look at the needs and objectives of the client. Uh, we say to the client, what's, the, what's your purpose in investing in property? Is it to create more of a bias for capital growth or do you need cash flow? Do you need higher yield? You know, depending on their income, um, because someone on 70 grand a year is going to struggle to buy a high negatively geared property. You know, if they don't want to be forking out 
you know, $500 a week to hang onto a property. Mm. So we've got to provide a tailored solution for each client. But we'll sit down with a client, do a fact find, um, work out their borrowing capacity. If they don't have finance, we'll recommend them to speak to a finance broker. Um, and then we go through a strategy chat, a strategy discussion around what their long-term goals are. Um, and then from there, if their borrowing capacity is, say, a million dollars, uh, we'll identify what locations we think will be best to meet their need. And there's no one size fits all. Um, it might be that you know they can buy a property in Western Sydney, or if they need to get something with a higher growth, it might be they need to buy uh, in Brisbane, uh, for example, mm. or in a regional area. Um, so if they want to add value and do a granny flat, um, or they want to actually do a subdivision, or even higher skill, they want to do three townhouses. You know, so we sit down and, and really take those steps. And then in terms of location, um, it depends also where they have other properties. It's really important to consider diversification. Um, also consider land tax issues. Um, if you've got four properties in Melbourne, it's probably time to think about buying in other states mm. um, because all Particularly the governments, Melbourne. all yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just after they've increased their land tax rates, so, yeah, yeah. So it's an initial, you know, fact find and, and discussion like that. So um, talking about you know location again, how much you know importance do you place on choosing the right type of property? In other words, you know, how do you decide whether you go for a house, a unit, terrace, townhouse, that sort of thing? Mm, yeah. So unit versus house, we th actually think of them as different markets. So in, always in our data, we, we never put them together. So a, a unit market in a given suburb will correlate to a unit market a couple of kilometers down the road, much more than it will the local house market. So it's a different kind of person. Um, I mean, even the stratifying individual house markets is a worthwhile endeavor. So uh, yeah, they're different markets. They have different forecasts. We have different reports for them. So, uh, uh, and then in between, so if you think of a, obviously it gets more and more unit, the more high density it is. So the more you're talking about a commodified asset. So it get, gets a lot easier to price something when there's been something extremely similar um, sold every other month. Uh, and then on the other hand, you've got houses um, particularly if they're on large blocks and it becomes, so on that end of the spectrum, it's much more about the land. Um, so broadly speaking, like we said, you're better off buying land because land goes up and uh, you've got to be very careful uh, to understand whether you know, how much are you really buying of that mm. land. And then in between, so you've got your terraces and uh, townhouses. So a, an important distinction there is strata versus Torrens title. Mm. Is it, do they use Torrance title all across the country? I know it came out of South Australia. They we do, use it yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You do use Torrance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, some that's town, in the term. Some townhouses can be strata and some can mm. be Torrance. Yeah, mm. yes, mm. when they you call it a, mm. a townhouse. Mm. So, uh, yes, yeah, so obviously a terrace has is better than a strata townhouse mm. because you've got the Torrance title, totally. you've got complete control. Uh, it's not divided up. You don't have to answer to a body corporate. Mm. You don't have a tragedy of the commons when no one agrees <laughs> to update stuff. Uh, but townhouses and villas, uh, I did. I haven't done a, the research in a while, but I remember a, a while ago finding that they did fine as long as they were in uh, good, convenient areas. So they behaved a bit more like houses yeah. uh, than units where there was convenience. But yeah, I, you, I don't know so much about if I it's... think that's a good summary answer because mm. I've found that townhouses are a great compromise between a unit and a house. Often mm. the budget precludes a, a client from buying a house because yeah. they simply can't afford it. If they, got, if they need 2.5 to get into an area, but they've got one and a half, then rather than buying a unit, if they can get in with a townhouse or a terrace, it's a, it's a great compromise. Absolutely, yeah. So a, a big thing about a house that they, people might not consider is how much is it going to cost to maintain it? Yeah. So are you at a level, it's more your high income people who think this way, but it's mm. like, do you value your own time? Mm. What do you rate it at? Yeah. Is it going to be every second Saturday, you're going to have to maintain the front mm. just to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. You, otherwise you feel guilty every time you pull out of the driveway. Exactly. Yeah. Or are you going to pay for a gardener if you're higher end enough mm. and uh, that you can mm. put that in as a cost. Yep. So exactly. uh, though having a, a, a little, having, maintaining a couple of pot plants and a, a bit of a paint job on a terrace is a much more easy proposition. And maybe mm. if you've got a good career, maybe you're better off spending those extra hours mm. uh, on that rather than mm. Uh, mm. maintaining a property. Certainly if you're a geek like me <laughs> who uh, doesn't ever, ever feel the urge to mow a lawn. There you go. <laughs> Actually, we're talking of incomes. You raise a good point because there's a lot of argument about incomes not keeping pace with property prices. Mm. Um, 
you know, what property types do you think will be in the highest demand over the next 10 years? Yeah, so the current environment, I mean, the big standout thing is very high levels of immigration. Mm. So half a million people a year. And it's very clear in the data that migrants have different uh, property preferences, particularly non-European, non-Northern Western European mm. um, migrants. Uh, they're much more about amenity. Uh, they're much more about convenience, proximity to work. Mm. Whereas your Anglos and your indigenous people and your um, Western Europeans and like second and third generation Australians are much more about space, privacy, quiet. Mm. Yeah, so if you have a huge influx of migrants, they have to go somewhere. Uh, they can't afford to go buy a house. They can't afford to go buy anything. So what are they going to do? They're going to rent a unit. They're okay with units. They overseas, but much more people live in high density accommodation when they're in the city, particularly in Asia. Yeah. So uh, the demand definitely has to be there for higher density and the planning, um, particularly in, in Sydney, is where there's limited uh, land, uh, uh, you're going to have uh, it grow up. So that's on the demand side, but you still have to have caution because can uh, the governments meet the supply is the other question. So uh, if they can, so from a point of view of capital growth, if you think that later down the track they will meet the supply, uh, then uh, that um, the unit may still be not that great a proposition Having said that, there are times like every market can do well. So if you can like there are certain units that have done well in like established suburbs where they've just had a ban. So the, the NIMBYs take over and they have a ban on building mm. any new units and um, you can see amazing growth mm. in them. Mm. But yeah, just be really mindful of uh, mm. supply, even though there may be demand. Yeah, I think um, that your higher demand or higher income people will always demand the houses mm. because they want that for their kids in the leafy burbs. I think that yeah. will always be a really strong demand for that. But equally, with incomes not keeping up with, um, uh, with, with property prices, it's going to be harder to save for younger people to deposit. Absolutely. So I think affordability is definitely going to drive a high demand for apartments yeah. and townhouses. And again, I think just it's just going to be a continuing relativity. But I do think there's going to be a greater proportion of people that are going to end up renting. I mean, about 30% of the population rent, 30% mm. pay off a mortgage, and 30% own their home outright. Um, so I think you're going to find that there'll be a higher proportion of renters. So my message to anyone listening is if you can afford to buy a property, get in as soon as you can and enjoy the capital growth ride. If you yeah, can. yeah, it's really interesting looking at data about younger generations. Mm. So there was a survey in America that found that half of millennials said their ideal relationship was a non-monogamous one. Mm. That, that blew my mind. Mm. And even more among Gen Zs. Mm. So they have a much more uh, fluid idea mm. of where they're going to be. Interesting. Uh, they, they're not told that they have a job for life. Mm. So uh, that kind of uh, lifestyle will lead to them uh, making renting more attractive. Mm. And uh, you have a more mobile uh, middle class yeah. today, people mm. taking jobs in other countries. Back in the day, mm. it would only be the, the very high-end expats. Mm. But now you can just go to a new country yeah. as a junior. Yeah. If you've got a degree, uh, especially, um, do, a, do a gap year, a working gap year in London and not even just be mm. working pubs, but mm. actually starting mm. your career. Mm. So uh, this mobility does lead to, obviously, a, a rental market is uh, more, ever more attractive. Perfect. Luke, I've got a couple more questions for you. Just to briefly, prop tech and AI, they're two mm. things dear to your heart. What are you putting into your business to keep up with technology and, and using AI? Yeah, so the new developments in AI, it's really exciting for us because we've got a ridiculously large database. So we've got billions of data points and it's always the challenge, how do you get the right data point out to the right person at the right time? What do they need? So we have a website filled with 5,000 um, of, these, of these fields and it's longitudinal, but there's this challenge of like, how do we, I, I can't sit down with all of them and uh, run through every single um, problem they have. So for us with our new product suite, it's very much about uh, identify the markets, um, type to them, chat to them automatically with AI, get them to the answer that they want, surface the data points that they in particular need. Mm. So there's a great ability to expand the functionality of products. Mm. Uh, that's one thing. I, I've talked also about forecasting. So 
the ability when you've got lots of data to look back in time and say back test and say, uh, would this really have this model? Um, it made this prediction at this time. Let's see if it really did. So similar to you, mm. an expert, you've you've got a track record. You're well respected in the industry. Um, you've made all of these predictions in the past. This is true for the AI as well. We can simulate what it would have done mm. if it was around making predictions in 1995. Mm. So it's one thing to look back on the past and draw conclusions. Uh, uh, so you know. Uh, Cities are great because they perform well in the past two years or whatever. Um, and then the opposite happens, yeah? Um, so the forecasting is really exciting. And also uh, inference. So this is not looking at the future, but just being able to get more fine-grained. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have much more fine-grained crime maps coming out, looking at local, hyper-local areas. So this is the part of this mission of microverbs to be really hyper-local um, and also uh, up to date. So if the government hasn't put out data since 2019, but people want it today, mortgage stress is a classic example. Uh, so we, we've updated our mortgage stress data because we've got other data sets that can help inform this. So you can train the AI to be like, okay, given the data that you knew in the past, um, this is what, what the outcome has been. You've got all this more recent data. Now tell us what this level would be today. Mm. Um, and then more broadly speaking, there's just more vibe. I would say in the AI these days, it has more of a sense of things. It's certainly not at the level of being able to describe the intricacies of a street or a, or even your average suburb in great detail, but it, it's getting a lot more human. And for me as a data scientist, it's very exciting to be able to uh, use these categorizations. So for example, to um, you find that a certain type of suburb did well over a period and then you can just ask the AI, what, what's the vibe of this? And they'll say, oh, it. yeah, it was these four factors these suburbs have in common is really Fantastic. exciting. Love it. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to jump straight to your personal involvement in, in property. Um, mm. What's been your best property investment you've made so far? Yeah, so here I'm a bit weird as well in that I'm actually an entrepreneur. That's yeah. my job. <laughs> so my big thing is to put money into my businesses. Business. Yeah. So uh, I got into... Uh, microburbs goes back to 2014, but my big goal was to do well with microburbs. So for me, my calculation is I put a dollar in and I should be able to get 10x or 100x out of that rather than real estate. And the more that I do that, the less I'm beholden to short-term needs. So the, the short-term, don't, we don't need to sell um, a certain amount in a given month. Um, we don't have to uh, be, I don't have to be as beholden to investors. Mm. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I own my, we've always owned homes yes. and we've done well out of that. So I'm a homeowner. Good owner. I'm, not, I'm not completely averse yeah. to it. Yeah. And also partnered with Jeremy Shepherd, who is an absolute seasoned yes. property investor. So uh, there's a huge amount of learnings from awesome. that. Awesome, awesome. Um, and do you have an outlook for the property market in 2024? What do you think is going to look, look happen next year? Yeah, I mean, the big thing, a half a million more people coming into the country, that's, a, that's really strong. So they've got to go somewhere. So it's hard to imagine prices going down. There, it will vary. So it's um, every single market, every single year, we find some places go up a lot and other places go down a lot. So there is, you definitely still need to pick, but I can't see any near-term problems with the property market. Uh, even though you've got affordability issues and um, you know it's a lot of income in order to to buy, it's just once again supply and demand. So what are the most Im you constantly? I guess it's the overall theme of the podcast is like, what are the most important things in both supply and demand? You need both to be able to answer that, and yeah. just way more demand coming in. Perfect. And finally, what's your best property tip that you could share with our audience today? Yeah, so never stop thinking about supply and demand. Never think about one without the other. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, focus on the big things. Uh, focus on the main things. Focus on things that you can uh, rely on over time, preferably as much as possible an indicator that works in isolation. You don't, if you don't need a complicated array of different factors, 
Uh, and I guess one last thing, don't buy mining towns. <laughs> They're love terrible. That. I love that bit of advice, mate. Well done. <laughs> now, if people want to find out more about Luke Metcalf, microburbs.com.au, is yeah. that where they can go? Microburbs.com.au, absolutely. Uh, we've got a whole lot of fine grain data and we've got um, investor suburb reports as well with Brilliant. loads of, uh, we've got forecasts and loads of uh, fine grained um, deep dives as well. Wonderful. Well, Luke Metcalf, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge and infinite data points with us today. Oh, really appreciate having you on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure, Rich. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thanks again. Thanks for being with us on another Property Buyer podcast. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please click on the SpeakPipe link and we'll answer this during the next episode. If you're looking to buy a residential or commercial property in the near future and would like to get the added advantage of having a buyer's advocate on your side, then please reach out to my team today and send us your inquiry and we'd be delighted to help. Please visit our website at propertybuyer.com.au where you can stay updated with all my latest market updates, weekly blogs and live suburb profiles to help you make better property decisions. We look forward to connecting with you again on the next Property Buyer Podcast.